So thank you to John Ryan and to Commissioner Borge for his support. Uh, I now turn to introduce somebody who actually really needs no introduction, Professor Sir Michael Marmot, Director of the UCL Institute of Health Equity. Michael has been an authoritative champion of health inequalities over many years, as his latest report, Health Inequalities in the EU, shows. It was published just before Christmas and gives us more vital ammunition to the cause. We know from his work with us in England and with the World Health Organization Europe that he can not only analyse the causes of health inequalities, but also helps to tell us what action is needed across the social determinants to reduce health inequalities. Michael, over to you. Look around. Look at the people sitting in the row next to you and behind. We are all concerned with taking action on avoidable health inequalities. It feels like only yesterday that health inequalities was a dirty secret. It was something we research types knew about and we worked away in our ivory tower labs and nobody wanted to know what the policy implications might be of doing research on health inequalities. It certainly wasn't anything that Europe would take on. It certainly wasn't anything national governments would take on. They didn't even want to know about it. And we researchers were just beavering away. And now look at this. We're on the agenda. The European Health Commissioner says we have to put it central place. This is really exciting. And we've had this action, which is trying to get member states together to take action. This is not in my script, by the way. I'm just telling you why I'm excited that this is happening. John Rouse asked me last night, what would I like to see happen today? And I said, this should be the start of something. We should make sure that it doesn't end today, that it continues. That's really my speech. The rest is a bit of detail. <laughs> Many of our countries have had improvements in health, which we usually measure by life expectancy or mortality, but increases, the Commission has said no decrease. Many of our countries have had increases in inequalities. And the question is, how should we feel about that? If life expectancy is improving for everybody, but the social gradient, the slope of the inequalities is getting bigger, how should we feel about that? Should we go back to a stage where we had smaller inequalities, but health was worse for everybody? Marmot's dilemma. Well, it seems to me that we have to have two clear aims. We want health to improve for everybody. And a second clear societal aim is that we want reduction in inequalities. We're making great progress on the first in many, if not most, European countries. Health is improving for everybody. And in some, quite dramatically so. We're making very poor progress on the second of reducing avoidable health inequalities. And that's a major challenge. So we need to have clear strategies to deal with this. And to that end, I've been involved in several reviews. We did the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, the WHO Commission, which we published in 2008. With great ambition, we entitled it Closing the Gap in a Generation, Reducing 40-Year Differences in Life Expectancy in One Generation, we said, entirely achievable with the knowledge at hand. In England, I produced the report, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, and it was a statement that if we put fairness at the heart of all policy making, health would improve and health inequalities would diminish. A great challenge to governments. The WHO European Review of Social Determinants of Health and the Health Divide, we launched at a meeting in London on the 30th of October last year. And now the review we did for the European Commission. We have a great deal of knowledge 
the structure we gave to the European Review was to look at four domains, life course stages, the wider society, the macro level context and systems, and I'll touch on these briefly. I've been saying from the beginning, from the time that we began the Global Commission, when people have been pushing me to say, you've got to take action to reduce health as a contributor to the economy. And my argument has been, well, yeah, perhaps reduction of avoidable health inequalities would contribute to the economy, but that's not the reason for doing it. We have a moral responsibility. Avoidable health inequalities are wrong. And I keep being told, you won't get any government to listen to you talking about social justice. They'll say, yeah, 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 but it's the economics. Well, I think we should talk about social justice. The reason for reduction in avoidable health inequalities is a moral one. If we can make the economic case as well, terrific. But that's not the real reason. This is from our EC, European Commission report, looking at life expectancy at age 25 by education, forgive the jargon, but low education, high education. In fact, it's a gradient. We've left out the middle group, but it's graded relation. The higher the education, the higher the life expectancy. There is a rumor. There is a rumor of a Swedish paradox it is alleged that Sweden is doing everything right and yet has very wide health inequalities. That's not what I see in this graph. SE is Sweden, high life expectancy, and relatively narrow health inequalities. That doesn't jump out at me and say Swedish paradox. That says Sweden's got high life expectancy and a relatively shallow social gradient. The other interesting thing about this graph is firstly, look at the people with high education. That's the open, whatever you call those things. There's much less difference in life expectancy among European countries for people with high education than there is for people with low education. Wow, that's interesting. The Ill health consequences of having low education depend on where you are. If you're going to be somebody with low education, you'd be better off to be in Sweden than you would to be in Hungary. Where you are matters. So it's not just your own personal characteristic that matters, but it's the things going on in the wider society that matters. And it also means that these countries with lower life expectancy kind of know what to do because the people with higher education are not suffering to the same extent as the people with lower education. So the social gradient is steeper. The inequalities are bigger as we go to the east. They're shallower as we go to the west and the north. And that's for women, a similar picture, but as usual, the inequalities are less with women, both between countries and within countries. We looked in the, our EC report at what countries were doing. And we have three clusters here. Those in green, relatively po positive and active response to health inequalities. In orange, cluster two, a variable Notice the diplomatic language, a variable response to health inequalities, and even more diplomatic language, relatively undeveloped. In other words, they're doing bugger all, but that's not very diplomatic. Um, but relatively under, uh, undeveloped response to health inequalities. And what's been happening? Since 2006, some countries have intensified their policy response. Denmark, Finland, Norway, the UK, and from cluster two, Estonia, Latvia, Spain, Iceland have had intensified response. The same level of policy response from cluster two and 
plus to three, and some countries, Ireland, Netherlands, Czech Republic, Cyprus, Greece, and Hungary, a decrease in the intensity of the policy response to social inequalities. This is not diplomatic language now. This is my language. That's a challenge. That's a challenge. It doesn't have to be that way. We know there are enormous financial difficulties across the region. We know that. I didn't dwell on it, but I had it on an earlier slide. Financial difficulties are not a reason for inaction. They make action ever more urgent and ever more necessary. We cannot use the financial problems as a reason for inaction. We can't say we'll throw today's children on the scrap heap till our economy gets better and then we'll say, oh my God, we've got an undereducated population. It's even more urgent to make sure we make the social investments that we need. Let me touch on what some of those are. Early years. Parenting and family support and we know that we can support parents. Perinatal services, early child development services make a real difference. I was talking in the US recently. You may know they have some political differences in the US, Democrats, Republicans. And I said, Democrats, Republicans, I couldn't care less. This is our children we're talking about. Is there a politician in the country who would say, I don't care about the children. And people sidled up to me and said, you'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> well, we care about the children. And if we look at inequalities in child well-being, in material conditions, education and health, at the top rank, De Denmark, Finland, Netherlands, Switzerland, in other words, narrow inequalities in child well-being, then Iceland, Ireland, Norway, Sweden. I keep looking for my country. Oh, my God. Here we are, down here at rank five. Uh, we're not doing well, but I do like talking in the United States. Uh, it's the only big country that looks worse than the UK. Um, um, we've got a major challenge. We're failing our children right across Europe and we in the UK are doing badly. I'll probably get told I've run out of time now by the chair. <laughs> um, but we need to look at ourselves and say, what are we doing wrong? This is very important to health and health inequalities. And there are things you can do. And look at the macro level. This is child poverty, where poverty is defined as less than 60% median income. Child poverty before and after taxes and social transfers. Look at Latvia. Before taxes and transfers, child poverty was 35%. In Sweden, it was about 32%. After social transfers and taxes, child poverty in Latvia is still 25%. In Sweden, it's 12%. In Slovenia, it's 10%. Fiscal policy makes a difference. The Minister of Finance might well be having more impact on health and development of children than the Minister of Health. And again, when I talk to my American colleagues, I show them this slide, said, you might want to know where the U.S. is. It's worse than Latvia. And I looked at them as I look at you. We live in democracies. Why would you tolerate this level of child poverty. It must be a level of child poverty that you want. Otherwise, you'd elect a government that did something different. It's entirely remediable. And we, as public health people, should be advocates for doing things differently. And there's much that we can do, and we've laid out in our reports. Working age. We said in the WHO Commission report, the CSDH, that work provides lots of good things for people. 
financial security, paid holidays, social protection. It defines who we are, our status, our personal identity, our social relationships. Work is absolutely vital. Bad work can kill people. It can damage mental health and it can damage physical health. So work's absolutely vital. I've said in every report that work is far preferable to benefits and welfare. We want, if at all possible, to have people working rather than be on benefits because work's important. But the quality of work really matters. And when we look across Europe, again from our European Commission report, looking at two measures of the psychosocial work environment, uh, effort reward imbalance, so how much reward you get for the amount of effort you put in, and low control by occupational class. The lower the occupational class, the more likely are people to have low control, the more likely are people to have work characterized by imbalance between effort and reward. And it's a gradient. It's not just poor work at the bottom and everyone's okay, everyone else is okay. It's socially graded. So having said work is very important, quality of work matters, unemployment is bad for health and it's particularly bad for mental health. Some of our politicians say that unemployment is a lifestyle choice. Tell that to the 58% of 18 to 24 year olds in Greece who are unemployed. Tell that to the 54% of 18 to 24 year olds in Spain who are unemployed. Tell them that it's a lifestyle choice, that they left school to go onto the social scrap heap of their own volition. So little do people like unemployment that they kill themselves and they kill each other. The higher the unemployment rate, the higher the suicide rate. The higher the unemployment rate, the higher the homicide rate. But there's good news. Traffic crashes go down. People can't afford to take the car out. But some of us are concerned about the adverse impact on mental health of unemployment. Can we do anything about it? And the answer is yes. What this graph shows is that a 3% rise in unemployment is associated with a 3% rise in suicide if there were no spending on social protection. And social protection includes active labor market programs, family support, health care, and unemployment benefits. In Eastern European countries, they spend about $37 US dollars ahead on social protection and a 3% rise in unemployment is associated with a 2% rise in suicide. In Western European countries, they spend about 150 US dollars ahead on social protection and a 3% rise in unemployment is associated with a less than 1% rise in suicide. Social protection makes a difference it can actually stop people killing themselves. That's worth having. Fancy, an economic policy that would prevent suicide. What an idea. When was the last time you talked, heard economists talk about anything other than gross domestic product? The very idea that you might have an economic policy that improved mental health. Wow. Macro level context. You notice I skipped over it, not that it's unimportant, but I know I'm going to be stopped in a moment. Wider society. As I've been saying, there's much that governments can do in relation to social exclusion and social inclusion, social protection across the life course, supporting and promoting communities. Look at these uh, data on generosity of social expenditure and the social gradient in ill health from Espendal and colleagues. What you've got here is the likelihood of being in poor health 
by education. So look at minimum net total social expenditure. You can see that people with primary education are much more likely to be in poor health than those with secondary and secondary education more likely to be in poor health than those with tertiary. The greater the generosity of social expenditure, the narrower the social gradient. You can make a real difference. You can actually narrow the social gradient by government action. And health systems, social systems are vital, but I won't go into them now. Let me say that our view of the evidence is that health inequalities are not inevitable. It's clearly not just a responsibility of the healthcare sector. There's no magic bullet hole of society. But it's not necessarily the responsibility only of national governments. I have to tell you about Malmo because I'm all excited. Where is she? Somewhere. There she is. Because I'm all excited about Malmo. Malmo read the WHO Commission on Social Determinants <laughs> of Health report and said, well, never mind what the national government in Sweden is doing. Why don't we do this for the city of Malmo? And it wasn't the health people, as I understand. The person I kept meeting was the deputy mayor. So it was right across all the sectors. They produced their report, and they said to me, what do you think we should do now? I said, get on the road. Go and tell everybody about what you've done. Go all around Sweden and tell them what you've done. Uh, I was getting emails from various parts of Sweden saying, do you think we should do a Malmö report? And I said, well, Malmö's done it. Why don't you take what Malmö's done and apply it in your domain? Because... It doesn't have to be done nationally. What I said when I was invited to the Swedish parliament, uh, they said to me, we're still discussing your WHO report five years later. I said, that's brilliant. It would be great if you took some action. And I said, what you'll find is every local authority in Sweden will be taking action on social determinants of health and you'll be running to catch up. You'll run round the front of the march and pretend you're leading it. Why not take national action? But if the national action is, I'm very undiplomatic, if national action isn't happening, it's vital that there be social action. And the six areas um, for action were very similar to what we've said in our reviews. Let me finish with this thought, which again came from our Swedish colleagues, and that we put in the WHO European review. If you're in a country that's doing very little on social investment, do something. A little bit makes a difference. If you're in a country that's doing something in the middle of that social expenditure range, do more. And if you're in a country that's doing quite a lot, do it better. Because what the evidence shows is we really can make a difference really quickly.